Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Prepare to have your beliefs challenged and your eyes open to the truth about protein and its effects on the body and longevity. In the following interview that you're about to see, you will hear from the world-renowned expert and scientist, Dr. Donald Lehman, who has been studying protein for over 40 years. Dr. Lehman will expertly pick apart the studies used by Walter Longo Sinclair and others who claim that a high protein diet is detrimental to human health and longevity. The truth is, the mouse and observational studies used to come to these erroneous conclusions simply do not apply to humans. Dr. Lehman will lay out the evidence and show you how these so-called experts are putting humans at risk by promoting a low protein diet without reliable scientific evidence. It's time to uncover the truth about the misinformation that's been spread by inaccurate scientific data. Don't miss out on this crucial interview that will change the way you think about protein and its impact on your health and longevity. So enjoy the video and I will comment on it after. The one that's been the most prominent over the last, like I would say, five, six years has been the protein and longevity conversation. And as is related to these studies and how they're designed, uh, I would like to use just a little bit of time because our audience has heard from some of the prominent researchers that are out there, uh, Walter Longo and and they know of the work of people like you know David Sinclair, and they've heard that these individuals are talking about, hey, that there seems to be some sort of link between longevity and having less protein. And I think this goes right central into the idea of study design and all the nuances. You know, we're we're all as uh, consumers of this health information, we're we're growing up because people like yourself are kind of taking us on that journey. So take us through that category and walk us through as an example of really questioning how research is being put together from from your point of view. I actually got my start in research doing longevity research with Arlen Richardson, who uh, worked with McKay and others. And so I have some knowledge of longevity uh, research with rodents. So let's do the rodent question first. One of the things we know is that rodents in, lack, in captivity, so they're in a sterile cage, they have no stress, they never get sick, they're basically never stressed, and they overeat constantly. At the University of Illinois, we considered a 40% restriction to be normal, to normalize a rodent. Okay, so when we look at the rodent studies out there, what we're looking at is the control is what, what we call ad libitum fed. They can eat anytime they want. And we know that rodents in that environment eat 24 hours a day. They will wake up in the middle of their sleep and eat again so their stomach's always full. And so we talked about mTOR earlier. mTOR is always active in those individuals because they're constantly eating, okay? So when you begin to restrict them, now we're beginning to slow this process down. And whether we're restricting calories or restricting protein, the animals will eat less. And now they're restricted from eating 24 hours a day till they get food and they will eat it. And so now we've changed them to meal eating. And when we talk about protein, we always talk about eating protein in meals. The worst case scenario would be to eat a little bit of protein every two hours, lots of small meals, because that might keep mTOR or meta metabolism constantly active. So what we want to do is pulse it. We want meals where it turns on and turns off. And so when you do the rodent studies and you restrict them down, what you're not, what you're actually not studying is is calorie, uh, you're not studying protein restriction, what you're studying is calorie restriction. You're studying the fact that obesity shortens lifespan. And we all agree on that, okay? So it's not really a protein question, it's a calorie question. Because in nature, you wouldn't see these animals eating all the time because they have the natural aspects of they can't find food, they have to go to exactly. new areas, they have predators that they're going to be going against. So in a laboratory environment, you're creating an artificial situation where they get to eat all the time. Exactly. So, you know, in the natural environment, they can't find food or when they're sleeping, it's not just sitting there in front of them and they can snack. Uh, you know, they go through fasting periods. <clears throat> they don't overeat. We know that rodents throughout their life will continue gaining fat. Uh, and that's because they're overeating. Okay. So that's one. And I, you know, I sort of discount the rodent data because of the way it's done. If they actually did meal feeding at equal calories for the whole lifespan, uh, which would be a lot of work and nobody's going to do it. If you, if you actually look at the research out of my lab, what you'll find is all of our studies were done with meal feeding. 
Nobody does that. That's one of the reasons our research is different than everyone else's mm. because we meal fed them. We train people will say, well, I don't want to know what rodent studies look like. You know, they're irrelevant. Well, they're only irrelevant if you do them wrong. If you make the animal eat the same way a human eats, they will react the same way. We got on that topic because, you know, you were talking about some of the challenges around the idea that too much protein is connected to mTOR and mTOR is associated with less longevity. Well, it's based on these mouse trials that the question is, again, is it done right? Now- Long and this is, are you looking at the right tissues? Are you I looking mean, mTOR is right in every tissue. So mTOR is regulated in the liver by insulin, in the muscle by leucine. So it's different. If you're looking at a tumor cell, it's re related to insulin. It's not related to leucine. So when people summarize these things, we're trying to protect muscle, and they're talking about tumors, um, apples and oranges. Can you talk about some of these observational yeah. studies that are there yeah. as well. The other the other data is the epidemiology, the observational studies. And so, you know, those drive me crazy because they're such crappy studies. Uh, basically, what you're trying to do, um, you know, it, the, origin, the origins of epidemiology is you have a red pill and a blue pill, and you know, 10 years later, you ask what was the effect of it. And that's pretty straightforward. But in nutrition, you've got lifestyles, you know, how do you weight smoking and stress and obesity and exercise and how many how much broccoli you eat with how much protein you eat? And so one of the problem with epidemiology is most of the studies will take one what we call food frequency questionnaire. I would ask you yesterday, what did you eat? And you would tell me, you know, how much protein, how much carbohydrate, how much, how many French fries you had, whatever. And then 20 years from now, we'd say, did you get diabetes or did you have a heart attack? So basically that assumes that you eat the same thing for the next 20 years and that a, what you ate yesterday represents what you're going to eat for the next 20 years. We know both of those are false. So, you know, the old story of computers, garbage in, garbage out, that's what epidemiology is. We're going with a hard endpoint, a death, mortality, diabetes, and yet we're starting with really lousy data, food data, you know, from food frequency. And one of my problems with that is that protein is the only thing people remember. If I ask you, how many eggs did you eat yesterday? You'd give me the exact number. If I ask you how much milk you drank yesterday, you'd give me the exact number. We drink it by ounces. If I ask you how much beef you had, you buy it by the ounce. I had a quarter pounder. I had a six ounce steak. I had a six ounce fish filet. But how many carbs were in the bag of potato chips? How many carbs were in the slice of bread? Was it 20 grams or was it 45? How big was the bagel? You know, and so the, the problem with the data is, is that Protein has reasonably statistical, you know, it's a sort of a narrow statistic and where the carbohydrates is all over the board. So when I see start statistics that basically say, well, protein relates to the onset of something, I always tell myself, substitute calories and carbohydrates for the word protein and you've got the right answer. As you saw in the interview, the researchers conducted studies in mice and human populations to investigate the effects of protein on aging and disease. They fed mice continuously and nonstop throughout the day for an extended period. Does this simulate the dietary behavior of humans? They then used a questionnaire to assess the protein intake of a particular population and its association with mortality rates. While questionnaires are a commonly used tool in nutrition and research, they do have limitations such as potential errors in memory recall and self-reporting. Based on this unreliable, inconclusive research, some scientists like Walter Longo suggest that high-protein diets will activate mTOR and contribute to aging and age-related diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and neurodegenerative diseases. As you saw in the interview, Dr. Lehman dissected the studies and showed that they simply cannot be translated to humans. As he stated, garbage in, garbage out, and that's what these studies are, garbage. I hope this interview shed some light 
and awaken you of the misinformation being spread on social media and by scientists about protein and mTOR. Have a great day and see you in my next video.